on the gut flora. This is the article I'm going to be talking about, but I'm going to start with a little bit of introduction. If you've ever read or heard anything I've written or lectured, you know I'm a bit fanatical with introductions. So my non-article minutes will be spent explaining why this article is interesting and why paying attention to this little video is not a waste of your time. And I've decided to introduce it with a biological narrative of mitochondria, which have nothing to do with the gut flora, at least on a practical level. Biologically, they're related. But the story of mitochondria and the story of the gut flora are remarkably similar. And everybody loves mitochondria. If you say you don't, you're lying. That's like saying you don't like the Beatles. Now, if you've never heard the Beatles, i.e. if you don't know enough about mitochondria to love them, here's a please, please me hook for you. If you relativize the size, mitochondria store as much energy as lightning bolts. Now that I know we all share the same valentine, I've decided to try to trick you into loving the gut flora by piggybacking it on your affection for mitochondria. The story of mitochondria. Our story begins with Lynn Margulis, uh, the girl on the left. I don't expect anyone to know who she is, so the character development goes something like this. She was an incredibly brilliant biologist in Massachusetts. Uh, she did her bachelor's at the University of Chicago, PhD at Berkeley, and taught at Amherst. Died in November of 2011 and looks like Meryl Streep on a bad day. That's all the character development you need. I assume everyone is at least vaguely familiar with the story of Jonah and the whale, so I don't need to tell the whole thing here. They made a veggie tales out of it. I was dating someone with a small child at the time, so I saw it in the theater. Old Testament story, man is swallowed by whale, both survive. The story Lynn told about mitochondria was basically Jonah and the whale. Uh, mitochondria have their own DNA. It's not yours. It doesn't belong to you. Uh, they're quite friendly to you, but they're a different creature altogether. So how did that creature get inside of you? Before Lynn's time, the story was painfully dull. Uh, the very brief summary goes something like this. There was a bunch of bacteria on its best behavior, just roaming around the biological marketplace, bartering for DNA, peaceful negotiations. I'll trade you some adenine for your cytosine, as unlikely as it was uninteresting. Then Lynn came along, and other people, but Lynn was the memorable mouthpiece here, and she said, no, 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 no. The real story was much more violent. These Strains of bacteria were competing against each other, doing violence to one another, eating and infecting and poisoning and digesting one another. Until one day, a large microbe ingested a smaller microbe as Jonah was swallowed by the whale, and neither died. Jonah wasn't killed by the whale's digestive juices, and the whale wasn't infected by the presence of an enduring Jonah setting up shop in his insides. And over time, the two learned to get along. Jonah became a serious stud at using energy, while the whale became a total champ at acquiring it. And eventually, they settled into those roles and became completely codependent. One cannot survive without the other. Endosymbiosis is what they call this theory. Endo meaning within, symbiosis meaning a biological relationship. So a Talmudic kind of a union of one creature living inside of the other. Who knows if Lynn's story is true or not? I can't verify that it is. Nobody can. Uh, her paper, which explained it slightly more scientifically than I just did, was rejected from about 15 journals before the Journal of Theoretical Biology finally accepted it. Uh, but then it went on to become the most scientifically plausible and accepted, certainly the most interesting, uh, model to describe how teamwork promotes biological success. And this is important because life is hard. It's hard at every level. It's hard for the microbes inside of you. You're not that good of an environment. You're always eating and drinking weird shit like scalding coffee and, and budget liquor. Uh, and it's just as hard uh, for you inside of your environment. Mother Nature is hostile and, and capricious and seems way more interested in exterminating species than protecting and promoting them. All environments outside of your home life are extremely threatening to your survival. Spend 48 January hours, homeless anywhere in New England. Technically, home is an idea. George Carlin can be credited with the clever observation that homelessness isn't a real thing. It's houselessness. But the point still stands. Spend 48 hours houseless in New England some January, and you'll have died, probably by the halfway point. Everything but your home life is extremely threatening. And in order to survive that punishing cruelty of Mother Nature, let alone flourish despite it, biological teamwork is critical. 
So over here, we've teamed up with mitochondria, everyone's favorite lovable Jonas. If we just digested them, we couldn't expect to go on living. And over here, in a similarly endosymbiotic sense, we've teamed up with a bunch of microbes, mostly bacteria, which we refer to as flora. And since the vast majority of these bacteria live in our digestive tracts, we refer to them collectively as our gut flora. Now, as a matter of nomenclature, gut flora feels slightly too euphemistic. Flora is the Roman goddess of flowers. Roman goddess. So we have an old polytheism living inside of us, and where it lives is interesting. The actual stomach is way too loaded in bile and acid and, and pancreatic secretions for the bacteria to successfully colonize. It's like an internal Antarctica. Yes, there's life, but the farther away from there you go, the more dense that life becomes. Likewise, the farther along the digestive tract you go, the farther from the stomach, the more hospitable it becomes, until you eventually reach the colon, where your feces is about 60% flora. And it just feels a little bit defamatory to talk about the Roman goddess of flowers as comprising 60% of our poop. But I would argue it's better than referring to our inner microbes as gut devils or something comparably unfriendly, because we would be in trouble if we thought of our collaboration with these bacteria as a sort of parasitism. Especially if we try to do something about it, if we try to sever our ties. To explain why it would be problematic to sever those ties, I present to you the article that I mentioned a few minutes ago, which is largely a list of functions carried out by this Roman goddess inside of you, which the authors refer to as a forgotten organ. The most important function is probably its role in your mucosal immune system. The mucosa is the lining that begins in your mouth and ends very near the toilet. It's involved in a bunch of secretions and absorptions and comes into direct contact with whatever you put in your mouth. Anytime a pathogen enters that mouth, before it safely leaves your butthole, the mucosal immune system does all sorts of magic on it. It's the first line of defense. The whole mucosal immunological militia from the privates to the lieutenant colonels, it's just a bunch of bacteria, and all of its military operations are carried out by the resident flora. And this article describes a lot of those operations in detail, all the specifics of the war planning and the military strategy, uh, the behavior of the infantry battalion over here, uh, what the artillery regiment is doing over here. Uh, it describes all the physiological specifics pretty thoroughly, which I'm not going to repeat, partly because I don't understand all of it, I'm not an immunologist, but even the parts I do understand aren't necessary for this level of discussion. What's important is the big picture, which is that your flora, your inner microbes, initiate a bunch of stuff, okay, inflammatory cascades, changes to genetic expression, important stuff. This induces that, which signals these, which upregulates this while inhibiting those. A lot of stuff is going on, and the success of this stuff depends on your floral balance. If that balance gets off over here, uh, you might wind up with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. If it gets a little wobbly over there, salmonella gets out of hand, and you typhoid yourself to death on the toilet. If it teeter-tots itself out of balance way over there, uh, a bunch of reactive metabolites are generated, and you're well on your way to colorectal cancer. These are all fairly extreme examples. Uh, usually it's just some inflammatory bowel issues, a brief flare-up to help embarrass you in public. But they illustrate the point that you want a consonant balance with your microbes. And lots of stuff affects it. Diet, exposure to antibiotics, your age and lifestyle, all of this matters. Unfortunately, we don't really know what an ideal balance is. We know much more about what an ideal balance isn't. Now, there are several very optimistic authors out there who say the opposite. They say we do know what an ideal balance is. Uh, these people are clearly stupid and should be distrusted. I realize common is a thinning slice of sense, and like hairline, sense doesn't seem to proceed with age. But all this takes is a moment's thought. Let me illustrate it by way of comparison. We don't even know what the ideal balance of calories is for athletic performance, or uh, what the best genetic constitution is for a triathlete, or uh, the best way to lower blood pressure. And we've been studying these things for a long time. 
With the flora, we haven't even identified what all of the bacteria are yet, let alone what they do. So statistically, the probability that we've discovered the perfect floral balance for human health is lower than the probability that I am a planet and all of you are my moons. Having said that, we definitely do know what bad balances are, and an especially bad one is a total lack of flora. Raise some animals with no flora at all, a totally germ-free environment, and you'll have some helpless pets. Um, a lot of punchlines of animal cruelty is your thing. If you're the Michael Vick of animal researchers, this is your model. In the absence of flora, not only is your immune system completely crippled, but all sorts of physiological processes end up compromised. Uh, this list just covers a few of them. There are plenty more, and we'll talk about none of them. Uh, you can read about this stuff on your own if you're interested. Uh, though if you are going to do some independent study here, I suggest you start with this one, the increase in enterochromaffin cell area. Only because it's the most interesting. About 90% of the body's serotonin is stored here, uh, which gastrointestinal serotonin activates vagal afferents, uh, which stimulate nausea. Uh, this article doesn't actually discuss this, but maybe uh, if you don't have enough bacteria to give you a real immune response, if you just throw up a bunch, you can reduce the infiltration of, of potentially harmful agents. Orthodontia aside, that might be a selling point for uh, potential bulimic, something to factor into the pros and cons, just in case you're on the fence about it. The rest of these I'm not going to discuss at all. Uh, the point of showing them is just to illustrate, in a very general sense, how a hyper-sanitary environment disrupts a lot of body systems. First world hygiene is effectively a risk factor for a whole list of stuff you don't want. The good news is that when the missing microflora gets reintroduced, uh, immune systems and a lot of other biological functions are restored. Some of this stuff takes time, though. You don't just reintroduce the gut flora and immediately have all systems intact. My favorite example of this time component concerns vitamin K and its effect on blood clotting. Unless the mother does something really weird while she's pregnant, fetuses have completely sterile colons. No flora at all. This is why if a little boy fetus comes out and right after severing the umbilical cord you keep that sliceable momentum alive and circumcise him, or pierce his ears, or whatever people do to babies these days, he'll bleed to death. No bacteria in the colon means no vitamin K, which means blood won't clot. Blood clotting is just one of thousands of fairly useful functions, and some useless, granted by your forgotten organ. Although I do have a problem with the nomenclature here as well. The root words in hemophilia are heme, blood, and philia, love. A hemophiliac thus loves blood. This seems a better description of a Stephanie Meyer protagonist than a person who bleeds to death, and somehow seems more ridiculous than referring to your poop as the Roman goddess of flowers. Either way, the ultimate point in all of this is that the gut flora is usually a really valuable teammate, a serious asset, but if you upset it, it can become a liability quite quickly. I would equate it to a spouse in that sense. I've never had one, so I can't say this with any personal authority, but I suspect most marriages are largely healthy and compatible, but could be rendered volatilely unhealthy and incompatible should one party cease to respect the other's needs. And that's the best description I can give to the relationship you share with your microbes. More microbial science and jokes in my next video chapter. CourtneyJensen.com